this week with some of the information coming from the state that perhaps there may be an end in sight to our our stay-at-home restrictions those that may be lifting over the next short while i'm going to be praying for that encourage you to do the same I want to encourage you also as as we're together today to be thinking of those that might be struggling whether it be in your family or, or people um, that you interface with but it's certainly a different time so commit those people to prayer as we do and continue to pray for our families as they uh, make their way through this difficult time. As we begin this morning, I uh, wanted to share a scripture and then we'll pray together. Um, and so our scripture I'd like to share this morning is Hebrews 3.13. Paul writes there, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Certainly hope that you enjoy our worship time together today. I encourage you to stay safe. Continue to uh, encourage one another in any ways that you can. God bless. And now let's pray. Holy Father, we are indeed thankful for the blessing of our worship time together today. We do pray that you continue to keep us safe, Father. Keep us free from sickness and illness and, and from the COVID virus. We do pray for those of our of our number that are sick that we may not even know about. But Father, as we enter into our worship this morning, I pray that you would allow us to, to put aside the things that cloud our minds and that, that take our attention, but wholly focus on you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Mm-hmm.
Good morning, church. As I um, as I sit here pondering a communion thought, I'm reminded of the consistency we have in, in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded that what he has done for me, and I'm also aware of the times we're in right now. Because when I, when I look at what's going on in the world and around us, it's easy to allow the troubles of the world to suck me suck me in and suck the oxygen just kind of out of a room, out of my lungs. We, you know, we can't go visit those who need us the most. We aren't able to celebrate the big things the same way we used to. There are no big wedding celebrations, no big birthday parties, or even huge family get-togethers. At times, we can't even mourn the loss of life the way we used to. All of our lives have changed, some more than others, And sometimes during these times we feel deflated, but however, we do have a reason for hope. And that reason is what Jesus Christ has done for us. That is his death that gives us the chance of eternal life with him. So this makes me think of Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastics 3, 1 through 8. There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And right now, this is our time to reflect on Jesus Christ, to be able to come in communion with him. If one thing that hasn't changed and never will change is Jesus. Whether we, the church, is not us in that building, it is us as individuals together. We, the people, are the church. And we don't have to stop being the church just because we're apart right now, we can come together through Jesus. Will you pray with me? Dear God in heaven, Lord, we come to you today. God, we're so thankful for the sacrifice made for us, Lord. Lord, we remember Jesus on that cross, and we remember his body, specifically right now, his body, God, that uh, was tortured and um, given up on the cross for us, God. God, we just ask that as we come in communion with you, that we do so with hearts that understand what we're doing, with hearts that love, just like you are love, God. God, we ask you to be with us as we go for communion, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. As we continue in communion, and before we partake of the fruit of a vine, I'm reminded of uh, Jesus' blood, and how blood is life, and how through the spilling of his blood, he made clean for us, he made atonement for us. And farther down in Ecclesiastes 3.11, as we continue this, He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom that God, what God has done from beginning to end. Just a beautiful uh, passage in Ecclesiastes that that, that builds me back up, that reassures me that there's, that God has a plan through all of this. And as we come together today and we um, partake in communion, I'm reminded that even though we might be separate more than we want, we are all still brothers and sisters in Christ. That one day the worries and troubles of this world will be over. And that through Jesus' sacrifice that we come here today to remember, we will all be together again in Christ. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God in heaven, Lord, I come to you again, God. God, I continue to thank you, to love you, 
and to remember you at this time, God, to remember the sacrifice made, God, for me, for when I was a sinner at my worst, you still loved me, God. God, I know your love for us is as strong as it's ever been, God. And we thank you for this time together, and we thank you for this church. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Don't you be more to me than any earthly God's authority, are you willing to bend? Are, are, are you willing to bend to the authority of Christ? The, the story goes that Babe Ruth, the famous hitter from the New York Yankees, was at a, a certain venue playing his game, and uh, a guy by the name of uh, Babe Pinelli was the umpire who called him out on strikes. And as Babe was making his way back to the dugout, he passed uh, Pinelli and he said, there are 40,000 people in this stadium that know that that was a ball. And Pinelli said, you know, Babe, that may be right, but my opinion is the only one that counts. The uh, authority of Christ is such that we have to submit, and we're living in an age when rules are just exploding. The, uh, our common, common life seems like we are back in school where everybody had control over what we did and where we went. And I understand that that's for our own good, but uh, still, uh, there is a part of us that bristles at anybody telling us what to do. And so the very nature of our Christian life is submission to Jesus Christ. And the thing that is so fortunate about that is the one that we are called to submit to also, with all of his heart, loves us. It's, it's, it's the perfect kind of submission to somebody who has your best interests at heart. And you know, we live in a world that has tens of thousands of opinions. And, and the question that we have is, Whose opinion are we going to listen to? Because everybody fights to be our authority figure. Um, since we don't really believe that anybody has much authority in our life, we kind of just say, well, that, you know, that's just your opinion. Uh, that may be how you feel, but that's just uh, the way you feel, and feelings are the same, and opinions are, uh, are, are abound, and one person's opinion comes from their own way, and yada, 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 it goes on and on and on. But in the discussion that we have in the Gospel of, of Mark, things are different. Um, because we find out here that the question can become of critical and penetrating importance 
when it comes to who is our authority, who are we going to listen to? Now, as I set up our, our study here in Mark chapter 1, um, there were some people who lived in a town that was a lakeside community on the lake or the Sea of, of Galilee. Um, they, uh, uh, they were living their life as, as good Jews, and they had established the synagogue. The word synagogue means house of prayer. And the synagogue was put into place for those people who couldn't make it to Jerusalem on the Sabbath. They, they, had, to, they had to spread out uh, Jehovah worship because everybody couldn't make it to the temple. So these houses of prayer became very, very important. And they also uh, had no paid staff. They had no established speaker. Rather, a coordinator within the synagogue would interview people and uh, would schedule those people to have their weekly opportunity to speak. Um, the townspeople here in Capernaum had heard about somebody. He had been traveling in the area around uh, Lake Gennesaret for the last few months. There were rumors that there were some miracles associated with him. They were probably skeptical that that was the case. But, but the word is that he had come to town and that he had been particularly and specially invited to speak at one of the Saturday services there in town. And they had occasion then to come out in numbers to listen to this speaker whose name was Yeshua or Joseph or Jesus as we would know him. After he spoke, the townspeople were trying desperately to figure out what was going on with him because he didn't speak like their other scheduled speakers that came in. His teaching was like nothing they had ever heard before. Notice with me, if you will, we're going to be looking at the 21st to the 28th verse of Mark chapter 1. They came to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. At this point, the demon has more faith in Jesus than anybody else in the synagogue. The demon knew exactly who Jesus was. And it was left up to those other people in the synagogue to see if they agreed with this emissary of the devil. What is this new teaching? Jesus responds to the statement by the demon, Be quiet! Come out of him! The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching! And with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This thing that happened not only amazed, but it scared them. We read this some 2,000 years later. And it causes us to try to make or to determine to make some life choices, choices as to who we believe and who has the right to tell us what to do. Who has the right to have authority over us? Now, 
Capernaum was the home of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. All of them had been leaders in the fishing community at this lakeside town. And in those days, uh, the synagogues would appoint these speakers to come in, and normally their speaking would be a recitation of what some of the uh, well-known rabbis, like Hillel and Shammai, uh, what they taught. And so, and so, you know, in our situation, I get to use the Bible, and I use it as my authority as I preach. The only authority in a sermon like this is taken from the very Word of God. Now, the speakers during this time didn't have that luxury. They had to deal with the contradicting teachers of the rabbis. And the best thing that they could say that would give any credence to their words was this. I tell you this, and Rabbi so-and-so agrees with me. Or, I, I tell you this, but Rabbi such and such thought it meant this. And so I've got this point of view and this other rabbi had that point of view. And basically at the end of the sermon, there was no invitation. There was no drawing of conclusions. Rather, people were left with the opinions of man just floating up into the air. But that wasn't the way Jesus taught at all. And that became very, very clear. In verse 22, this tells us uh, that after a few weeks, these people were blown away. They were amazed by his teaching. They didn't know what to make of it, for he was one who spoke with authority. As Jesus is delivering his address, a man comes to him that is possessed by an evil spirit. And the spirit says, what do you want with us Jesus of Nazareth. So it wasn't a spirit. It perhaps was a legion of spirits. Uh, very likely the same circumstance that we read about of the Gerizim demoniac uh, uh, that, that said that he had, uh, the name of that demon was legion, which meant in Rome a thousand. It would be a thousand. Now, I don't know how many were inside of this guy, but it seemed that demons travel in packs. And it was a pack such as this that was dwelling within this person. Now, I think it's important to understand that the, the presence of demons in the first century was almost a commonplace thing. Uh, demons could inhabit little children that would throw themselves in the fire. We have that account. Uh, hermits that live on an island. Uh, or, or somebody that even decided to come to church. Have you ever wondered why this demon, possessed man, even came to church that morning? Well, it's because of the innocence of the man. He did nothing wrong. There is no indication that this happened. And, and you might ask the question, why is it, Jeff, that we read about demon possession so clearly in the Bible, but we don't seem to witness it ourselves? Well, there are a lot of examples or opinions, here we go again, about why that might be the case. But I think you can make a good argument that says, with the appearance of God himself in the form of a man for that 33 years, it makes sense that Satan himself would amp up his efforts to combat the very presence of Jesus. Plus, Cultures other than our own have a more, much more definitive understanding and belief in the idea of the personification of the devil in what is called a demon. So this man walks into the synagogue and he says, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Well, Jesus could have said, well, you came to me. You came to me. Have you come to destroy us? That's interesting. You know, these people that were listening had never heard of a demon being destroyed. They never heard of any power on earth that could destroy a demon. You might have one take residence in somebody else, but who can destroy a demon? Interesting that this, this group of demons that both understand 
uh, understood who Jesus was, also understood that Jesus had the power of life and death over demons. Demons themselves. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus says, be quiet, shut up. Come out of here. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out. And he came out of him with a shriek. Now, this sounds pretty terrifying to me. I mean, this is one of those services that when they went to the restaurant for dinner after church, they really had something to talk about. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, what is this? It's a new teaching. It's new because it's a teaching with authority. In verse 27 and in verse 22, the same word amazed is used. But in verse 22, the uh, amazed means these people were blown away, that they were astonished, that they were absolutely overwhelmed by what they were hearing. But the, the word amazed as it's used in, in verse 27 is they were astounded, but also fearful. They, they were afraid of what was being said by Jesus it was so unusual that it filled them with fear to see that Jesus even had authority over demons. They had never heard or seen anybody that could do something like that. You see, the demon came, identified himself to Jesus, and Jesus didn't even let him complete his statement before he said, be quiet, get out. And immediately that happened. Jesus has the authority. He had the authority over Satan. With us, with us, it's kind of the other way around. The thought of a demon actually being in somebody, making them do something, sounds strange to us and scary to us. We seldom explain anybody's behavior as being odd because they're filled with the demon. I mean, we, we don't say that. You know, what, what happened to the dog? How come Pooch is running around crazy like that? Well, there's a good chance he's filled with the demon. Or, or which one of our kids, well, I was going to use that example, but some of us have felt at times that maybe our kids were filled with demons. In any case, it's not something we think about in our society at all. But I, I would have you consider this, that maybe that is to our discredit and leaves us remarkably vulnerable. There is evil that doesn't make sense in our world. There is evil that doesn't make sense. We're at a loss to explain it. Our culture doesn't understand it. And when you see what certain people have done, the explanation that they are somehow possessed by a demon makes more sense than we could imagine because it seems beyond the pale of anything we could consider anybody doing had they not had a force taking them over because of it. Jesus simply makes the decision that the demon will no longer have control and the matter was, matter was settled immediately. He just gave the order, come out of him, and the demon obeyed. Are we living our lives in such a way that he has that kind of authority over us? What level of authority are you willing to give to Jesus? this morning? How much will you submit? Does Jesus have the right to tell you what to do and how to live? Those are questions for us. Now it doesn't question the authority of the one we're speaking to. It simply questions our ability to recognize that authority. The demon was overcome 
by the force of Jesus' holiness. And while the demon shrieked as it left this person, that might have been an exclamation of relief because a demon could not have been comfortable being in the same room with the Son of God. Jesus offers his command to the demon to be quiet, and it was. This idea of the word rebuke, what does it mean to rebuke? It's used many times in Scripture. In Psalms chapter 9, verses 5-6, through six, You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Endless ruin has taken over the enemy. You have uprooted their cities. Even the memory of them has perished. And then in Psalm 76, verses 5 through 7, Valiant men lie plundered. They sleep their last sleep. Not one of the warriors can lift his hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both horses and chariot lie still. You alone are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you're angry? The people in Capernaum, learn way more from Jesus' sermon than they ever anticipated. What they learned was who Jesus really was. He was not a, a prophet or just a teacher or just a good person. Jesus had the power over the devil himself. They would find out, and find out soon, that he is the Son of God. God on earth himself. It's a marvelous story. How willing are you to bend? How far will you bend because of the example of Jesus? In verse 27, the people were all so amazed they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and one with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. I mean, everybody has an opinion, but we're still looking for answers. When our spouse has been unfaithful or deceived us or made a decision without us and we have to decide how to act, is God's word our authority on those personal and explosive decisions to stay or, or to leave? Does God give you any inclination of what you should do through his word? And, and if it does, if it does, how far are you willing to go to be obedient? My friend, it must be, his word must be our authority because he who speaks also decides how things will be. He who speaks also holds all the power to make things happen and at what moment his power can decide that this is how it's going to be in your life, Jeff. When we're making decisions on how to grow our businesses or how to uh, climb the ladder at our jobs, and we see that others are taking shortcuts and others are bending the truth, the question that we have in our lives are, is, are we willing to go there? And everybody has answers for you. Everybody perhaps would say, you need to do what you need to do to take care of number one. But if the Word of God has any authority over your life, you're going to be encouraged to be honest and to deal fairly. But the question is, how, will, how willing are you to bend to that authority? When we're making decisions about how to live our lives, I am just asking you in this simple short lesson this morning, who has the authority in your life? How much are you willing to bend? You and I must come to, the, come to grips with the power of Christ who makes his word true. His decisions make things happen. His authority makes it so. And it is up to us to hear him and to obey. What a fellowship, what a
on Jesus, on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarm. We lean on Jesus, on Jesus, on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. When we lean on the everlasting arms. Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Oh, we lean on Jesus, on Jesus, lean on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? When I'm leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace. Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Oh, I'm leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, I'm leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Oh, we Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms.